We're going to get into our study of 1 Peter again. This is where we left off. At Sunday before last, we were looking at the unjust setting, and we're talking about slaves in verses... Uh, I left my glasses at home, so... Uh, verses... The verses that's in that chapter. <laughs> I think it's 17 through 25. I think it's what it is, if I remember correctly. But uh, he's talking about people living in an unjust situation in which they are unable to really do anything about it. And Peter's saying, okay, how do you live a Christian life in the middle of that? Because it's, you know, you can't wait till you get out of it because in all probability you never are. So how do you live for Jesus Christ in that? And the two things that he had given back in verse 11 and 12, to abstain from uh, fleshly lusts that war against the soul and to live such good lives that the pagans would know the difference. So Peter's saying you need to live in a radically different way as you face unjust situations. And he talked about submitting to government. Now he's talking about slavery. And he, we worked through some of that. And the question that comes up to us in dealing with uh, people and situations where things are unjust, why should we act differently to those that are treating us unjustly? And that's a, that's a real question. In that world, in the Roman world, it was expected that slaves who couldn't get out from under being a slave would probably be lazy. They would probably try to undercut the master, that they would be a, an irritant to the whole situation. Maybe they would not be profitable, although some of them were, very much were. But by and large, this is what was expected of them. Peter saying, do something radically different. But our question today is, why should, why should we act differently to people who are being unjust to us? And Peter tells us in verses 19 and 20, he says, it is commendable if a man bear up under the pain of unjust suffering because he's conscious of God. And this is what we ended with, that even if you suffer for doing good and endure it, this is commendable before God. And in that commendable, the word commendable here is the word chorus for grace. And we've heard Matt preach about grace. And he said it is grace. It is a an example and a witness of the presence of the favor of God when we live a different life in an unjust situation where people expect us to be one way but we live a radically different way to be a witness for the Lord and the question that comes up to us is that do we put up with a bad situation being conscious of God we don't do it to try to promote ourselves we don't live differently so that we can say we're somebody, but we're conscious of giving an account to the Lord for how we've lived our Christian life. So as we think about, you know, facing unjust situations, facing being around unjust people, people that just grate on us, how do we live for Jesus Christ in that? We bear up, we endure being conscious that we're doing it for the Lord. We're not doing it for them. We're being a witness to them. We're doing it for the Lord. So, you know, it's, it's something to think about because in this day and in this world, think about your jobs. Think about people that are working in other situations where things are going on that just simply doesn't make sense. How people act, how people are doing how do we present Jesus Christ? Because we can hardly talk about it anymore without getting in trouble. How do we do this? We live a radically different life, different behavior, different words before these other folks so that we want them to ask us, why? Why, why, why didn't you do why do you act like this when, you know, blah, blah, blah? 
And there's the, there's the door that the Lord opens for us to be able to witness to them. Questions, comments? Now, let's take us a little further. Do we apply these words only to, to those who attack our faith? Or does it include everybody who insults us? Now, we like to make that distinction. Well, you know, if somebody's persecuting me for my faith, then that's fine. I'll bear up on it. But if they ain't persecuting me for the faith, I'll give them one chance. The next chance is going to be bad, you know. Okay. How does, how does Peter's words apply here? Because slave masters, they were going to be insulting at times whether they were Christian or not. We're going to face people who attack us. So do these words apply to those who attack our faith? Or does it include everyone who insults us? Everyone. Hmm? Everyone. everyone. Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 48. Jesus talks about, you know, if someone had, wants to take your coat, give them your cloak. You know, go that extra mile, all that. And he's not necessarily talking about just because of your witness, because you're a believer. Now, this is, you know, it's hard to swallow this. You think about people who just look to do you wrong. Look to get on your nerves. Look to take advantage of you. And we can think of all kinds of things we'd rather do. But what we're expected to do by our Lord is give a different response than what the world expects. Remember in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, the writer said, make every effort to live peaceably with all people. Now, in saying that, and I, I think I can hear your minds turning, Scripture does not call us to be weaklings. We're not doormats. The Lord doesn't expect you to hide in a corner in your life and in your character. We're not called to be weaklings, but it does warn us against being bullies or getting a sense of ourself from the defeat of others. That's a whole different thing. How many of you were ever bullied when you were in school? Elementary school, high school? Anybody that want to testify about it? That was the tradition, I guess, you know, hazing. Most of us probably have experienced some sort of being bullied, whether it's by somebody we work with that are just mouthy and all this, or maybe we can remember back to school. Scripture doesn't call us to be weaklings, but not to be that type of person, not to be a bully. Don't get your sense of your self-esteem because you've got over on somebody else. That's what most of us like to do. That's what most of the world expects us to do. But we live a radically different life. And we can't really say, well, it was, Peter, Peter could say that to them. It was, it was all right for them. It was easy for them to do it. No, not as a slave in the Roman Empire. It wasn't easy to do this. It's more easy for us to live this way than it was for them. So, you know, he's, he's asking us to, to, to think about this every day as you interact with others. Now, you got a question? You got a comment on that? I don't know why I'm turning the page. You know, can't read what God hardly. Force of habit, I reckon. How do you feel about that? Huh? Was that simple? 
Yeah, it's not simple. Because usually by the time I'm already in the heat of the battle, I ain't even thinking about it. Yeah, I ain't, I ain't really worried about what God said about nothing. I'm dealing with this. Yeah, I mean, we've been there. We've, we've all been there. And this, this isn't an easy thing that Peter is, is asking and the Holy Spirit is, is asking us to do through the words of Peter. It's not easy, but it takes real concentration. It takes real sensitivity to the Holy Spirit rather than to ourselves. And that's not an easy thing to do. But that's... Oh yeah. You get up and, and you go out and there are it's like there are you go from one to another yeah. that are really unjust situations mm -hmm. that you have to learn when to say something and when yeah. not to. And, and when to one thing that's very hard for me is typically I'm not fired unless I'm by the day. You know, then I'm talking. But, but um, Oh yeah, y'all believe all that, don't you? Mm -hmm. yeah. We're, we're seeing the fulfillment of what Jesus said in Matthew 24. Because of all these things that are coming to pass on the world, on, on earth, the love of many will grow cold. Paul told Timothy that in the last days, people will be lovers of themselves. And he goes down that list. And we can see all of that just being multiplied in our world in, in degrees that we've never seen before. And it is because most of the situations we face, we really can't do anything about it. Uh, we're not in a position to. We don't have that kind of influence. And so Peter's saying, okay, but this is how you live with Christ in that. This is how you witness for that. You can't, maybe really can't say much, but you can live much. Because we want, we want them to realize after they've done everything, why? What is it with you people? I had a person ask me that one time. He said, why don't you cuss like everybody else? Because he could, you know. It was just, it was just seeing that difference. You want people to see something so different about you. But they ask you why. That's when you have the opportunity to do something for the Lord. Now, in thinking about not being weaklings, another question that comes up, where's the line between making every effort to live peaceably with all men and defending ourselves? Or our families. Now, think about this passage. This passage is not speaking to self-protection. In looking at it in the general, larger sense of our life today. Now, it's interesting that the New Testament is quite silent on self-defense. How many passages in the New Testament do you know that speak to self-defense? Turn the other. It, and that's about the limit of what we of what we hear and read in the New Testament. So, however, the interesting thing about this as we read scripture, the Bible is freely using figures of contest, battle, and war in describing our journey in Christ. Paul is fre frequently uses that analogy. Now, also the New Testament doesn't condemn military service. Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. 
neither John the Baptist nor Jesus Christ ever condemned military service. Matter of fact, it was a centurion to whom Jesus said, I have not found so great faith in all Israel as to this captain of a hundred in the Roman military who was dominating the nation of Israel at that time. So, knowing the line involves sensitivity to the spirit in the moment. And okay, do I have to put up with a situation if I can get away from it? No, you do not. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 through 16, verse 21. Tells, speaks of a person in an, in an unbalanced, unequal marriage situation. And Paul also says, and he's speaking to slaves when he says it, much of what Peter says here, but then he says, if you can be free, if you can get free, do it. Bible does not promote slavery. It admits the fact that this is what the world is that you lived in, especially in that day. But if you can get away from it, you can get away from it. Get another job. Move out of that neighborhood. I mean, you know, maybe extreme examples, but you don't have to and if, it, and if it comes to a point to where somebody's in your face and they're threatening to hurt you, allow the Holy Spirit to direct, you know, your self-defense. The Bible does not say you can't defend yourself. We're not pacifists. Now, some people believe that the Bible teaches that. And if that's what you believe... That's okay. I'm not going to argue with you over it except for the fact I don't think the Bible teaches that. So do I have to put up with a situation if I can get away from it? No, you do not. It's kind of like what they used to teach. I don't know what they teach now, but what they used to teach when they were teaching your concealed carry. If you can get away from that situation, get away from it. Because that may determine as to whether you are the person being charged or the other individual. Now, if you cannot get away from it, then you stand your ground. But he said, if you're on the other side of the car, keep moving on away from the other side of the car, away from that individual. And that's what they said. Now, it may have changed now. I do not know. But in witnessing unjust situations. So, verses 21 and 22, Peter says, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. We're called to live a different life. Just as we are called to become Christians, Peter said, you're called to do and to live like this too. Now, what do you think that means? What does it mean when, it, when you say you, you were called that you should follow in his steps? What does that mean to you? If you're saying you're supposed to be living like this, you're supposed to be living like you want, like you want you to. Okay. Other ideas, yeah. And nothing wrong with that at all. What, what does it mean to you? To this you were called that you should follow in his steps. It, 
then how do we apply? How do you apply this into the situations of your life? You have an example where this worked for you? Where you followed this? Maybe it was an example where you maybe didn't follow quite to the <clears throat> step, you know. How do we apply this in our lives? We're called to exemplify grace in unjust situations, the favor of God that has been poured out upon us that we should follow in his steps. And he tells us, you know, Jesus very much was in an unjust situation. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. He was innocent of all that he went through. We may be innocent, but we're required as believers to follow in his steps. Now, how do we do that? That's the question. How do we apply this? What, what does following in his steps in an unjust situation look like? He gives us three examples. Verse 23. Look at what he said in verse 23. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. When they hurled insults, and you can read it in John and the other gospels, he didn't retaliate. Pilate even asked him, he said, why don't you say something? He did not retaliate. Familiarity breeds contempt. That's yeah. it. So I do, I, you know, it was so telling about something, but you can go out and the people you do benchmark with, I mean, there's no telling you know, what they've done and who they've done. Thank the Lord for this and that and blah, blah, blah. But it's okay, but then when you meet somebody and head on the church, you have more of a tendency, of, you know, you have a higher expectation that you really shouldn't have. So I do think. <laughs> yeah, you could put it that way, and that's, that could be very true. Yeah. Well, the Bible tells us that God punishes those who are unjust to us. God punishes them. Yeah. It's His battle to fight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like the saying I've seen before I have to let God fix it because if I fix it, I'll go to jail. How many times have you been in a situation where you, the Lord, Lord, you better fix this course. I'm, I'm fixing to pull my nine here, you know. And if you can escape, do it. But grace to a point, but then when there's danger, you, you've got to move away from that. Or whose life is, whose life is it going to be if the person's unjust? And, and you bring up a good point with that. Does grace only extend to us in trying to get out of a situation, or does it extend to us when we have to deal with the situation? I think grace is present there. It could very well be the grace that requires you to act in a self-defense manner to prevent something from happening to yourself or to your family or to friends or whatever it might be. Think it's grace. It operates with that. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know. And you think, how can somebody that professes to be a Christian act so unjustly and cause harm to somebody? Mm -hmm. I mean, and we see that all the time. Yeah. There's hardly a week goes by on one of my news apps that I don't hear of some preacher or somebody somewhere that's done something that is just despicable. And had been doing it for some time, you know. And when we do run into Christians, church people are almost like family. If your family can't hack you off, you can't get hacked off. Same way, if church people can't hurt you or make you feel bad or make you mad, then you can pretty well handle family, you know? I know y'all know these things. <laughs> I know you've experienced them. You have, to, you have to exemplify the grace of God. Because we're not God. So our expectation from Scripture is that we exemplify Christ. We follow in his steps. It may not make any sense to us what somebody is doing or not doing. And it may make us very angry. It may make us you know, whatever it might be. But our responsibility first is to be conscious of God, as Peter has said, and to exemplify grace. And the thing, look at what he said, you know, out of what he quoted about what Jesus suffered, he said he didn't retaliate. He didn't try to, you know, well, blah, 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 to Pilate. The only thing he told Pilate was the truth is that you would have no power unless it, except it was given to you. And when he asked him, are you a king then? He said, yeah, I'm a king. I ain't your kind of king, but I'm a king. And it just shook Pilate all up, remember. Made no threats. If anybody could have said, God's going to get you, it would have been Jesus. But he didn't. He entrusted the issue to God. Even on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He entrusted the situation to God. So we're not supposed to say God's going to teach you. <laughs> we do, anyway, you know. You got to say it well. Yeah. yeah. I knew I finally hit a nerve somewhere. Yeah. I heard of the, I've heard of this one lady. She was a preacher's wife down in South Carolina. I heard of her. And, and somebody had stolen her pocketbook. And she was all bent out of shape about it. And one of the things that she said was had been her out of shape was the fact that that and I bet they'll, they'll, they'll repent and get saved and, and God will forgive them of it. <laughs> Basically, before I can get to them, is what she was saying. You know. She didn't want God to get them. She wanted to get them. That's what, what, yeah. 
I just thought that was funny, and that stuck in my head for, I don't know, how many years now. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. So if God, if anything that happens to us is because of his grace, his love, his mercy, In his providence, in his, you know, yeah, depending on what your situation you're talking about, but yes. Yeah, you entrust it to God, yeah. He knew it before it happened to us. And he's saying to us in the middle of that situation, going to exemplify grace. So he's looking at us to see how we react. Yeah. And everybody else is too. Yeah. And when we react in a way that is radically different than the world, they may never believe it, but they're going to, they're going to be tempted at least to ask the question, why? That's when. As Peter will tell us in chapter 3, verse 15, be prepared to give an answer for the reason of the hope, of the expectation that is in you. That's not a, that's not a, a statement of apologetics so much as it is a statement of saying, this is why I act like this. This is why I don't retaliate. This is why I don't make threats. This is why I entrust the issue to God. This is why I have to leave it to God because if I fix it, I'll go to jail. This is why. I have a relationship with Jesus Christ and I know he's in control of the thing. Doesn't mean you have to explain why you don't like it. Doesn't mean if the, if the Lord opens the door to... For you to witness about why something is so wrong, he, will, you know, he expects you to do that, but at the same time, you want people to ask us, why are we different? Why do we look different? Why do we talk different? Why do we act different? And that's when the door opens for us to maybe change an unjust situation. At least in our life, or maybe the lives of people around us. You may not change the national government, but you might be able to change some situations around. When, when Paul wrote to, about Philemon, to Philemon, Onesimus, his servant, had run away from him. A slave had run away from him. He had found Paul in Rome and got saved. Paul said, I'm sending him back because that was the legal right thing to do. He said, but... but Receive him not as a slave, but as a brother. That's a radically different reception. Because in that world, he could have, Philemon had the perfect right legally to kill him, beat him half to death, whatever. Paul said, receive him as a brother. And really, Philemon, I could use him because he's very helpful to me in the ministry. He didn't tell Philemon to release him. He kind of intimated, Philemon, you owe me a lot because of what I shared with you of the gospel. I really would like Onesimus to stay with me. He was gently seeking to have Onesimus set free from slavery. But Paul followed the legal aspect of sending him back. But he sent him back with Receive him as a brother. That's radically different. Do something different. And if you can escape, do it. Now, just in case we think our situation in life is worse than what Peter's talking about, Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we can live for righteousness. He went through all that unjustness so that we might be able to live for righteousness. He provided that for us. He said, I know you can't do it. So I'm giving myself in your stead that will open up the door 
through for the Holy Spirit to come into your life and help you live for righteousness because you can't do it on your own. We can't live a radically different life than the world without a radical change in our life through salvation. And as Peter says at the end of that passage, that for you were like sheep gone astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. Lost sheep act like lost sheep. Sinners act like sinners. Don't expect anything better of them. They act like lost sheep. But we have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So don't act like lost sheep. Because you're not. So don't act like it. Don't retaliate. Don't all that stuff that he just talked about. Live a radically different life. I mean, these, these words, we've read this, you know, a hundred times in our life. But he's talking about real life here. He's talking about how to live for Jesus in the middle of a really bad situation. And he told Peter, he said, I can call 12 legions of angels if I want. He'd have wiped out the entire Roman Empire. But he didn't. You think anger is sin? No. There is a righteous anger. Be angry and sin not. You can be angry. What do you do with it? Because anger is a, is, a, is a human emotion. Of course, it's, fa it's a fallen human emotion. It's infected by the fall. But at the same time, you don't have to act on it in a sinful manner. It goes back to that, you know, I have to let God fix it because if I fix it, I'm going to go to jail. That's, that's being angry and, you know, not following through with grace. But Jesus had anger. Yeah, Jesus had anger. When he, when he emptied that the temple out I don't think he was just smiling and said hey y'all I'm just you know it's all right it's wonderful no he made the scourge of whips and he said get out of here his grace was toward his father where it should be yeah I think it's a wonderful example for us to use sometimes to think about okay where does huh yeah yeah he's saying Billy you cannot get the point can you you know so We'll pick up on it, and we're going to get into something a little interesting next week. Uh, starting verse 24, what is Peter talking about? In physical, is he talking about physical healing? Verse 24. And then we're going to get into wives and husbands. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> No, no. So we'll get into it next week. <laughs> <laughs>